Welcome to Clinical Application of Arterial Blood Gases, Part 1, Carbon Dioxide. For this presentation, you should be familiar with units of measure, such as millimeters of mercury, normal values for arterial blood gases. I'll show those in a moment. How the arterial blood gas is acquired, there is a movie on YouTube that will help you do that. Uh, basic respiratory disease concepts, and finally, uh, respiratory patient assessment. Uh, the next slide shows the objectives for this, so take time to look that over. Showing on your screen now is a blood gas, and you can see the normal values for pH, pCO2, PaO2, bicarb, and so on, although this presentation will focus mainly on PaCO2. Carbon dioxide in the bloodstream travels in several different ways. The one that we're concerned with is the pressure of arterial CO2, uh, is, which is what is represented here. PC, PACO2 is constantly being added to the blood and is a result of cellular metabolism. Body cells use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. Uh, that carbon dioxide is carried away uh, by the bloodstream uh, to the lungs where it can be exhausted. Uh, so there's two factors that control PaCO2. Uh, one is the metabolic rate and how quickly you're producing CO2 and putting it into the bloodstream, and then how quickly you're eliminating CO2 in the lungs. Uh, this uh, ventilation, ventilation of course is respiratory rate and tidal volume, that brings PaCO2 down. So those are the two forces, and that's what this slide is trying to show, the two forces that affect PaCO2. Uh, metabolism pushing it up and minute ventilation pushing it down. In the next slide we'll look at that in more detail. Minute ventilation or minute volume as seen in the slide is the product of the respiratory rate shown by the little f stands for frequency and tidal volume. For example a person breathes a 500 cc tidal volume 12 times a minute that would be six liters per minute uh, minute volume or minute ventilation. Liters per minute is the units used for that. And one of the rules that you need to know, and it is a very, very important concept to respiratory therapy, is uh, how minute volume or minute ventilation goes opposite to carbon dioxide. In other words, if minute ventilation goes up, carbon dioxide goes down. Uh, tends to go down, and if minute ventilation goes down, carbon dioxide tends to go up. Of course, in respiratory therapy, we're most concerned with uh, increasing CO2s due to uh, inadequate minute ventilation. Now that you know how minute ventilation affects carbon dioxide, I'm going to change it, and that is how a changing breathing pattern has an effect on carbon dioxide. On this slide, what you see in uh, the first set of data, patient A has a tidal volume of 400 and a respiratory rate of 20. That gives us an 8 liter per minute minute ventilation. I'm going to call that slow and deep. Patient B has a 200 cc tidal volume and a respiratory rate of 40. Also a minute ventilation of 8 liters per minute. I'm going to call that fast and shallow. Now you might think from the first set of data that both patients, since they have the same minute ventilation, have the same level of carbon dioxide, when in fact patient A has a normal carbon dioxide and patient B has an inadequate uh, level of ventilation and has a rising carbon dioxide. How can this be when they both have the same minute ventilation? Well that's when we have to really look not only at minute ventilation but at alveolar ventilation. Remember that the first 150 cc's of ventilation, or the first 150 cc's of tidal volume, is uh, basically wasted tidal volume. It's dead space. It's the air in the trachea, the main stem bronchi, uh, down to probably about the 20th generation before you start exchanging gases. So let's subtract 150 cc's because we learned in the Egan's that. Uh, Typically, dead space in a person is one milliliter per pound of body weight. So let's uh, say an average size 150 pound man, and you can see that in red in the second set of data. 
let's say that uh, they're both 150 pound men and let's subtract 400 minus 150 and we get an actual alveolar volume of 250 times 20 which is equal to 5 liters a minute minute ventilation or alveolar ventilation in patient B the 200 cc tidal volume if you subtract the 150 cc's from that you only get a tidal volume then alveolar volume of 50 cc's multiply that times 40 and you only get an alveolar ventilation then of two liters a minute so you can see that it's really alveolar ventilation that's important and in if you uh, evaluate the alveolar ventilation you see that patient a has a much higher alveolar ventilation and is adequately ventilating and has a normal CO2, whereas patient B is hypoventilating uh, and has an elevated CO2. Let's go back and modify our slide to represent, uh, instead of minute ventilation now, I have alveolar ventilation is equal to frequency, the little f, times tidal volume minus dead space. And remember, dead space is one milliliter per pound of body weight. And so now I've represented how changes in alveolar ventilation affect CO2. Uh, again, the most important being the low alveolar ventilation causing the uh, rise in carbon dioxide. So uh, the statement at the bottom says PaCO2 is really about alveolar ventilation. Here's what happens to our patients. Patients come in with acute lung compromise, could be pneumonia, uh, as a result, they'll have an increased work of breathing as their lungs don't exchange gases as efficiently. Uh, enough of this might lead to muscle fatigue. And uh, what happens when muscles start to get fatigued is you're in a, unable to uh, take as deep a breath. So a patient will start shallow breathing and they'll compensate for that by increasing their respiratory rate. So shallow breathing followed by an increased respiratory rate is what you'll typically see in our patients who have increased uh, levels of PaCO2, and we call that uh, impending respiratory failure. Now, respiratory failure due to muscle fatigue is not the only cause of, of uh, increased PaCO2 or respiratory failure. Uh, there's also failure of breathing control, such as you might see with neuromuscular diseases or injury. Uh, cardiopulmonary arrest, uh, sedative overdose, particularly narcotics, and uh, even oxygen-induced hypoventilation might be a cause of an increased level of PaCO2. This is clinical application after all, so how do we intervene in a patient with acute hypoventilation? Well, uh, if it's a case of a sedative uh, overdose, we can try sedative an antagonists such as Narcan for narcotic overdose. Uh, but in many cases, the choice is mechanical ventilation. We could bag mask ventilate until we can intubate and put the patient on a ventilator. In some cases, uh, non-invasive ventilation may work. Uh, an example of that is BiPAP. Finally, we haven't mentioned hyperventilation. Hyperventilation, of course, is uh, due to an increased uh, minute ventilation. Uh, brings CO2 below 35 and this might occur uh, because of hypoxia, a very important cause of hyperventilation because uh, uh, increased respiratory rate is a compensatory mechanism for hypoxia. So simply treating the hypoxia may stop the patient from hyperventilating. But people also hyperventilate because of pain and anxiety and both of those can be treated with drugs. That's all. Come back next time for part two. PH. Oh.